thanks so much for joining me here on The Bearded Prophet. This is Adam coming to you with a very important special guest today. Uh, Elisa is going to be joining me, and we're going to be talking about the radical movement, the protest movement, and Elisa was a former 60s radical back in the time of protest, and she has a very interesting story about how she got encountered in that movement, where she's at now, and I bet she has some really strong thoughts and views on what's going on in today's protest and riot movement. So welcome, Elisa, to the program. Thank you, Adam. It's great to have you. And I would love to hear a little bit of your story of kind of where you started off in this radical protest movement in the 60s and where things went with that. Well, I started off in um, Chicago. I was going to the University of Iowa in the summer of 1968. My girlfriend, Sukes, and I went to Chicago to work with Project Head Start in Cabrini Green, which was a, a high rise there. And we got this, we shared the same waitress job so that we would have the same days off. And the first night that we got there, it was in the basement of a, it turns out it was a communist bookstore. Perfect. And they told us about things that were happening, getting ready for the convention. The Democratic National Convention was in Chicago that year and there were plans for protests. So we got the information and after that meeting, we were broken up into smaller groups, probably by neighborhoods. So my friend and I went to this up above a, a little store, a small group, and I saw this man who was handsome, he had greasy hair, beautiful eyes, and he swore worse than anyone I had ever heard. And it turned out to be my husband. <laughs> hey, <laughs> radicals meeting radicals. I mean, that's yes. right where it's at. <laughs> I did not recognize him as that right away. Well, I was wearing the waitress uniform and he thought it was a nurse's uniform and he thought that I could get him some drugs. So he started hitting on me right away and I was really flattered. And he invited me to go with him to deliver underground newspapers around Chicago. There weren't any published in the city at that time, but we got some from California. Nice. So we went to the Black Panther office, we went to the Women's Liberation office, and there were other groups, uh, Hispanic groups, and um, actually we ended up being the Rainbow Coalition because there were a lot of different um, oh, people represented. So, that, so that's, that's the roots of the Rainbow Coalition, Black Panthers, Women's Liberation, you know, all these, all these radical groups from the 60s. Very interesting. Yeah. That, but Jesse Jackson stole the name, so it's not that Rainbow Coalition. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. And he was laying out this uh, heavy rap about Marxism and communism, and I was for McCarthy, who was a peace candidate. I was not into radical stuff at that time. So he took me to his apartment, and he gave me some marijuana. And I had smoked marijuana before, but I did not get high when I smoked it, so I just thought, eh. Well, this time I got introduced to the stone blind munchies and I went to his refrigerator and he says don't open that door and inside was the coleslaw that ate Chicago it was <laughs> pulsing <laughs> and next to it was a carton of milk that could have stood up without the carton mm -hmm. it had solidified so he took me out for dinner to a Chicago diner and they had a blue plate special, hot roast beef sandwich, potatoes and gravy, green beans, salad, and drink. And my girlfriend and I were living off hot dogs and kipper snacks, so this was really a treat. So I ate the whole thing, and he just sat there looking at me, and he said, would you like another round? And I said, yes. And he bought me another whole dinner, and he just watched me eat it. I ate the whole thing, and I could feel myself falling in love. <laughs> so we started going to these meetings and later on in the summer was when the convention was in August and the first 24 hour in one 24 hour period I was with three different guys who got arrested while they were with me so I started feeling kind of insecure I mean one it was a 
a traffic stop and they took him off to jail. It was a left hand turn or something. They were just arresting everybody. For those of you who don't know, the 1968 Chicago Convention, and I talked about this briefly in one of my previous episodes on podcast, was a, was a total uproar, as Elisa is telling us. This was a convergence of radicalism and these radical movements trying to disrupt politics as usual, if any of that sounds familiar, to get radical agendas, <laughs> radical candidates to, to shift. Even the Democratic Party at that point wasn't radical enough for these radicals. They said, no, right. we need to hijack it. We need to force it. We're going to use force, use rioting and protesting and other tactics. I'm sure you can tell us more about it to, uh, to force this radical party to become even more radical or they're not radical enough. Any of that sound familiar? So, like I said, these three guys got arrested, and then I was in Lincoln Park, and there was a, a rally. I think Bobby Seale was talking from the Black Panthers, and I ran into somebody from the University of Iowa right on the outskirts of the crowd, and he got arrested. So, I was started looking around for somebody strong and handsome with beautiful eyes, <laughs> and it was Jim. I thought it'd be good to be protected. And we formed a group called the Rats. So there were several of us, maybe about 10. And if we felt if we felt like we were in danger, like the police were coming after us or something, we would yell out rats and we would all come together and then nobody would mess with us. I mean, we weren't showing any weapons or anything like that, but it was just, they were picking off single people at that point, like at the edge of the crowd. So that, week I got radicalized. I got tear gassed. We, we wow. all got tear gassed several times every night actually. And it was, this, the situation was that a lot of people had come in from out of town yes. and they were just going to camp out in the park. And Mayor Daly said, no, you're not going to camp out in the park. And so he sent the National Guard. The National Guard came with these Jeeps with barbed wire across the top and they were pushing us out of the park with tear gas and they were wearing masks and they had all these spotlights and everything and it just made you get more radicalized because you saw so much of what we considered to be injustice mm. and that I mean, we saw some police that were apparently frustrated because they couldn't get to us and so they just hit whoever was on the sidewalk and it happened to be in what i considered an elderly couple i don't know if i would think they're elderly now and everything was just in a turmoil. So after that week, I went back to the University of Iowa and it was such a culture shock. I just, I just couldn't even handle it. I was majoring in elementary education and I was supposed to be teaching, you know, history about how everything is good and wonderful in the United States. And I thought it really wasn't. And I, and I ended up dropping out of school in my senior wow. year with my parents paying for it. They never let me forget that part. So I moved to Chicago and Jim became my roommate. And during the next few months, we started an underground newspaper called Rising Up Angry. And the, the sign of it was there was a fist with a, a sunrise around it. And that was our insignia on the newspaper. So we had our own underground newspaper now that we could hand out. But we also started an organization. And we, um, like I, I helped women get abortions. They were not legal at that time. So I, I helped set up uh, things like that. Plus I wrote article about that. And um, there were just a lot of connections in the city. We were organizing white street gangs in working class neighborhoods, while the Panthers, who we had a coalition with, were organizing black street gangs. And we were organizing them to make an army to fight against the police. Mm, defund the police, kind of the roots of it right there, you know? Get rid of the police, because right. they're bad. Pigs, <laughs> they were called pigs at that time. Absolutely. Yes, off the pig. And we felt like the, it was just something we should do by any means necessary. And that's a quote from Chairman Mao. Wow. Well, what caused you to move away from that? 
I mean, you got really into it. You were doing all the things, defund the police, promote abortions, uh, you know, street gangs, white gangs, black gangs. I mean, get rid of the establishment. I mean, newspaper publishing. I mean, you were into it right in the thick of things, the things we see movies about. What changed you or what got you to reconsider any of those radical stances that you took? Well, one of the things we did that made the police unhappy was we started a gun store and it was actually legal. And we would only sell to revolutionaries and Black Panther, you know, street gangs and people like that. And they got, Jim and I worked at the gun store. And it was mostly, mostly that you ordered the guns through us. There was somebody there who, um, his name was Clark, who had the papers to do something like that. So I, I'm sure that got us on their list. I got arrested once. And so I mean, I tried to be a different person. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> I had a different set of IDs, but they still fight figured out who I was. And um, so I, I was on their list again. Anyway, they started, um, they killed Fred Hampton, who was the head of the Black Panther Party in Chicago. And my, my husband, he wasn't my husband at the time, but Jim was close to Fred Hampton. And we started feeling like we might get killed. We were having some um, internal problems in the revolution. Some of us got started taking MDA, which is called a love drug. And we were less likely to want to just go and blow up something. And some other people wanted to go and blow up something. And so there was some um, disturbance within the group and I revealed to Jim that I had been stealing his money and I had a stash and we could buy land and guns and leave Chicago. So I actually, that's when I used my other set of IDs. And that's what we did. We found the cheapest land in the United States of America, which was in Northern Minnesota. <laughs> It was back tax forfeited land that went up for auction and nobody bid on it. And we took, we actually, someone helped us uh, steal a reloader and we took some guns with us up there. We got, we went to Minnesota on March or on May the 20th of 1971, six inches of snow on May the 20th. So that was the first shock. The next shock was that as soon as the snow melted, the mosquitoes came out. <laughs> we were living in a station wagon. We found our land was on a dead end road, which was good. But it was one reason it was so cheap is it was not on the road. You had to walk back 40 acres to get to it, 120 acres that we bought. And we had five years to pay for it at $10 an acre. I mean, that was even cheap back in those days. So people started coming, wondering why we, these hippies, as they called us, were on their dead end road. <laughs> and there was a family living at the end of the road. They had five children, and they were a very wonderful, straight family. And they invited us to church. And we said, nah, we, we don't have anything to wear to church. So they, the 4-H girls made me a long skirt <laughs> in what they thought a hippie would wear. And they invited us to church again. They said, it's warm and dry and there's food there. Well, that appealed to us because like I said, it had snowed. So we went to church with that family. And first of all, it was the youth group. And there was this man, the only word I could think of was rinky dink. He was a traveling guy who was coming through and he was telling stories. He was telling about David and Goliath. And I had heard of David and Goliath. I was raised in the Episcopal Church and we had a lot of the Bible stories and everything. So I knew about David and Goliath. And then at one point he was talking about Jesus and he said, okay, everyone bow your heads and close your eyes. So I was checking out, making sure everybody's eyes were closed. And he said, raise your hand if you know if you die today, you would be going to heaven. So I'm checking out who's going to heaven and who's not going to heaven. And the people who took us there, they were going to heaven. So I thought, well, I have to straighten them out because we were more into Buddhism and stuff like that. 
And downstairs we were talking to, well, then we did have refreshments downstairs. I remember it was egg salad sandwiches. That's very important. And they asked, um, my husband was talking, or Jim was talking to the guy who was the rinky dink guy. And Jim was talking about how it's, it was good to have, um, how you should kill people for what's right. And the guy didn't quite know what to say. And um, so we went home and we were, we were camping out next to our station wagon. So we thought, well, what should we do about this? So we decided to chant to Buddha and pray to Jesus at the same time, because we figured we'd have it all covered that way. So that's what we did. Well, that week I got pregnant and that, that took a change in our lives. We, our neighbors, even though it was just May and now the beginning of June, they were saying, you have to get ready for winter. <laughs> it was Welcome to Minnesota. <laughs> yes, exactly. So they helped us get ready. We had wonderful neighbors. They, they're all of them were wonderful. They were helping us get ready for winter. The funny thing is, we didn't realize that they also had guns in their car when they came to see us. <laughs> and we had guns in our car when they came to see us. So we got um, ready for winter by trading something. We traded a, a tanned deer skin for an old camper trailer that ha they had removed the windows on. And we fixed that up back in the woods. We pulled it back to where our land was. And we got ready for winter. We had a, a wood heating stove and that, that's basically what we did is we cooked and heated with wood. We had kerosene lamps. And so um, nine months later, <laughs> along came Hopi Tamarack and he was our little baby. We were going to, we planned on having him at home, but neither one of us had ever even seen even a video of somebody giving birth. And we ended up having to go into the hospital. And um, he was a colicky baby. So when we did bring him home, I was totally nursing him and he was totally crying. And I'm sure that part of it was from the atmosphere too, because we were still using drugs. And, um, and so that would, I mean, babies can pick up on things like that. Plus he was colicky. So he was, it was really driving me crazy because I had stopped using the uh, like hallucinogens like LSD and MDA and things like that. I was still smoking marijuana. And I think I was going through a kind of withdrawal in that sense too. And so that didn't help my nerves any. And I was crying and the baby was crying and Jim would come in from the woods. He was working as a lumberjack and we were all crying. And I really, I was scared because I, I felt like I was going crazy. I felt like I was in this boat going towards the waterfall and I didn't have any paddles. And I was trying the Eastern religions. I was trying standing on my head and focusing on an acorn turning into an oak tree. And the baby was crying the whole time I was trying to do this. He didn't like it. He didn't like that stuff. He, did, he could pick up on that too. So I, I really cried out. I, I didn't know if, if God was real or not. I mean, it didn't really have anything to do with my life, but I remember standing in a field and just calling out to him and saying, help, you know, I don't know what to do. And some local people who were in a group called La Leche League had told me about Jesus. It was a, a group for nursing mothers. And I, so I just kind of brushed it off, but they were really nice people. And so I said, if Jesus is the way, let me know. Because I always wanted to do what was right. <laughs> oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that we immediately ran into a couple people who were kind of radically minded that came down where we were camping. And they stole some guns and brought them to us and we buried them on our land. So we had guns buried on the land. We had planted marijuana. And we had made uh, we had this big 50 gallon barrel that we had made crab apple wine in. So that's how we were preparing for the winter. So that was when Hopi was nine months old. And we, we started a food co op up there because that's the kind of thing you do when you're a radical who has left the city. 
And some of the people that joined it were from the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church because they were vegetarians and we had all this really good um, vegetarian type food. So at Christmas time, they sent us a card and it was advertising their cookbook. It was called 10 Talents. And it had a little tract in it called Steps to Christ. So Jim looked at it and the first part of the track talked about the beauty of nature and we loved living in the woods i mean we didn't care if it was 40 below zero or not it was wonderful and so that really interested him and he said well you should look at this because the only i had a lot of time to read i just sat there holding the baby all day long because <laughs> if he if i put him down he immediately would just wake up and cry the whole time so i started reading the tract and several times during the each little section, it would give you the opportunity to ask Jesus Christ into your heart. And so I would just skip over that because, I mean, the first one, it said that all have sinned. And I certainly didn't relate to that because I didn't think I had sinned. And then it would go on telling about other things about Jesus, which I, and I knew the stories about Jesus. But then I decided to do it as an experiment. And so I decided I will, even though I haven't sinned, I will ask God to forgive me of my sins. And I could, re I could relate to him being a spirit because of the LSD trips. So I would just ask him to come into my heart. And I, oh, I felt scared. I felt like I was, it reminded me of when I was a child and I was go going to go off the high diving board for the first time. And nobody was making me go off. I just wanted to. And I got up to the top of the board and looked down and I knew I could belly flop because it would have been such a so crushing to have that not work as well as all the Eastern religions and peppermint oil and everything I was trying. So I asked God to forgive me of my sins and I asked him to come into my heart and nothing happened. <laughs> you would think the lamp would flicker or something. I mean, if it were an LSD trip, there would have been some nice lights and things happening. But the, the booklet says you won't necessarily feel anything. And I thought, well, I got that right. And, they, and so it said to memorize one verse. And it was, greater is he who is in me, and that's Jesus, than he who is in the world. And I guess that was the devil. So I memorized that one verse. And when Jim came home, I did not tell him <laughs> what I had done, or he would think I went over that waterfall I was telling you about. But the next day, which was December the 20th of 1972, I was making whole wheat, honey, marijuana brownies. And I was wondering if it was okay to put marijuana in them now that I was a Christian, you know, for a whole day. But my philosophy was, well, until he shows me otherwise, I'll just go ahead and do it, because I really thought marijuana was good. So I made the brownies, and I was putting them in the wood cook stove, and I dropped the pan upside down on the rug right in front of the stove. Well, I told you that Jim swore, wor swore worse than anyone I had ever heard, and that's something he had taught me. And I was ready just to let loose and there was an actual voice that said, are you going to say that with me in here? And I thought, oh my goodness, he really came in. <laughs> I recognized that it was the voice of Jesus. And I found out later the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I did not swear. And I was so excited that actually it wasn't until three years later I realized he may have, might have been showing me I shouldn't put marijuana in my brownies. <laughs> it was a while to catch on to things. So Jim came in from the woods and I was pretty excited about what had happened. And, he, and I said something about being a Christian. And he says, what are you talking about? You're not a Christian. I said, yes, I am. I've been one for a whole day now. And he said, get back. So he read that little book too well actually it was amazing to him because he came in and i wasn't crying the baby the baby was crying and i wasn't crying so that was number one sign that something had happened so he got the little booklet and i don't know if either of us ever finished the booklet <laughs> 
but he was he took the booklet and then went out he went out walking in the woods very close to where we were living we lived in the woods and he walked on a nearby lumberjack path and he asked god to forgive him of his sins because well he had one <laughs> he hated the man that he worked for he was doing some uh, construction work with a just a small company and the guy would would do something and then he would realize oh i shouldn't have done it that way and so he'd make jim redo it and and he was really upset about that so he asked god to forgive him of this hatred he had for this man and he actually felt a physical weight lift up off his chest and he was so excited i'm, I'm covered with goose pimples right now he was so excited he came running into our little house and he was jumping up and down and saying, out of sight, out of sight. But we didn't know about hallelujah. And he, he said that something had really happened to him. So we were both, we were holding hands and we were jumping up and down and, and out of sight and far out. And we thought, well, what do we do now? So the people had actually, in that length of time, had moved away from the end of the road our car battery was dead, so we couldn't go any place. Frozen, actually. <laughs> so we sat down on the floor, and we had Jesus sit on the rocking chair. Because I figured he talked to me on the 19th. He can talk to me on the 21st also. And we asked all these questions about the war in Vietnam, about racism, about Chicago, and... Um, you know, just all these really difficult questions. And we waited to hear if he was going to answer. And we didn't hear any voices. And we said, okay, prove to us that you're God. Well, the next day in the mail, and it was pretty amazing that we even got mail because we had changed our names. But we got a letter from my childhood friend since we were two years old. Her name is Shirley, and she was in Houston, Texas, and she was a blonde bouffant, just, you know, straight-A student. She was the perfect person, really, and she was married. Besides that, she was married to a Houston oiler who they had met in University of Illinois. Well, in that year, she and her husband had both gotten saved. They got saved through uh, had something to do with the Billy Graham crusade i think maybe it was somebody who had been to one or something and so she was telling us about that in her letter and she answered every question we asked the chair and we said Whoa. far out <laughs> Whoa. so that was the beginning of the change in our lives we and we were so excited about it well we still are i still am <laughs> jim's up in heaven but i'm still excited we used to excited too. <laughs> and so we were, we told all our neighbors, we told anybody, we'd stop people on the street. I, I had what I called a laundromat ministry because it, it's so boring sitting in a laundromat watching clothes go around. I would just share my testimony with all these people and people got saved right in the laundromat. That is wonderful. It sounds like you went from radical for the world to radical for Christ. Yes. And how has this affected your view of justice and even today's social justice crusades and warriors protests? How has it affected your view of justice and what's going on today? Well, it's funny that you would mention justice because Jim became a lawyer. Hmm. And it happened when Roe versus Wade was passed because we just, we almost had whiplash when we got saved because everything we had ever learned was wrong and including abortion. Abortion was legalized at that time through Roe versus Wade. And when you, we heard about it on our battery operated radio, Jim says, I need to go to law school. He said, this thing is going to be settled in the courts. And that was so out of our realm of how could we ever do this that uh, anyway that's a whole other story we did go to law school <laughs> and he it's and it's also interesting because at the, in the end of his life he had um, dementia 
the and the one story that he kept on telling was about Fred Hampton of the of the Chicago Black Panthers and how he was murdered by the police and Jim was one of the people who got the evidence and I think because he was also thinking along that line he chose to become a public defender in um, Virginia and he saw he saw the injustice in that situation he said he says if I have a client who is black he's going to get a worse sentence that if I have a client client with the same record who did the same crime, yes. Was right. And he and he said, and that includes coming from the black judges. Mm -hmm. He said they were even harder on them. It was almost like they didn't want you know that for black people to have a bad name out on the streets or something. He couldn't really understand why that was. So when I heard about um, with not not knowing anything about the group recently about Black Lives Matter and that there was going to be a rally on a Monday downtown in Richmond. I planned on going to it and I was trying to find somebody to go with me because I didn't think that um, I don't like to go places by myself and my son who I'm living with right now actually said he would go with me. Well on Thursday before that Monday people showed up downtown and they started riot rioting they did they did smashing of windows and looting and setting fires and things like that so at that time we did not go down on monday <laughs> for that reason so since that time i have been investigating what black lives matter stands for and while i definitely agree with the words black lives matter um i i also believe that some of the people i was Part of the organization with in Chicago are involved in these mm -hmm. still I mean they're they have been continuing to be revolutionary all these years some of them worked in the education department and some of them worked in in, in Chicago some of them worked in uh, developing the curriculum in the schools some of them have children and their children are teaching in the schools and um, traveling around the globe, connecting with other people like that. Right, because you were right in the heart of it. I mean, these are real people that we sometimes read about in history books or watch movies. And you were right in with this same crowd, Black Panthers and, uh, you know, pro-abortion and radical and, you know, shake up society, get rid of the police. And yeah. in some ways, the chickens have come home to roost, as they say. I mean, there were seeds birthed in the 60s that, you know, radicalism and hippies and revolution and drugs and free love. And, and, and now 50 years later, things are, uh, you know, they're, those seeds are coming to fruition or their children are here and they're active now. And, you know, one thing that struck me, Elisa, when you were sharing was just how much violence was involved. I mean, this really wasn't about peace and love. I mean, we idealized the 60s, yo, peace, man. But it was actually, you were selling guns, you were accumulating weapons. I mean, this was not just, and there was riots. And, and we're seeing that today. How could a movement supposedly based on peace and love and justice, I mean, who wouldn't want that? Why was it so violent and why is it violent today? Well, there were a couple of different groups. Some of them were, we, we, didn't, we did not call ourselves hippies. Okay. We were we called ourselves revolutionaries revolutionaries and there were people in chicago who were more into the the drugs and the free love you know that type of thing and they were not but they were for peace and we were we were different factions so there so, so some of us were into the guns from the very beginning but some of them were not some of them were for peace mm -hmm. so our our insignia was the power to the people and theirs was peace Okay, so you were on the more violent side even. Yes. Uh, what, do, what do you take away when you see violent protests today in names of, of Black Lives Matter or BLM as I prefer to call it? Because like you, I agree with the slogan, Black Lives Matter, absolutely. But I don't agree with the political movement BLM, this sort of radical organization. So what do you take when you see people getting violent in the name of BLM or Antifa and you know rioting, violence, trying to force change? What's your reaction to that? I'm thinking that some of them are paid 
to do that? Yes, yes. I made a previous episode about that. There are paid organizers, paid protesters. After they're busted in, they're brought in, and their one and only goal is to create chaos and, so, and havoc. So you can't, there isn't anything that you could say or do that would make them happy because That's they're right. paid to do something that they're going to do. That's right. 100% right. And I think that people who are, I, I mean, I know some people who are idealistic that went down there to the marches here in Richmond, and they did not intend to riot. In right. fact, I think they kind of went off to the side when it happened, but some sure. other people joined in sure. on, the, on the rioting. And then the local mayor says that it was done by white supremacists. <laughs> and so you have all of this conversation going on. So what's your take? What, what do you think is driving these protesters? What do you think they really want? What do you think they really need? And I'm not only talking about the paid ones. I'm talking about normal kind of young men and women primarily, kind of like you were. You got caught up in something in Chicago 50, you know, 50 plus years ago. You were, hey, I want to see the world change. And you were young, idealistic, and you, you and your husband fought your best to do that, to change the world. Um, then you had an encounter with Jesus, you know, and things really changed, or you changed. Right. Um, what would you say to these young, primarily young people who are getting caught up? Yes, we want this change. Yes, we're going to riot. We're going to march in the streets. What would you say to them? Well, I think just like the way they're thinking, I didn't believe what I was hearing. When people would say that communism was not good, that Cuba was not good with Castro, that uh, Mao Zedong was not good, he was killing a lot of people. I didn't believe it because they, I felt like they had lied to me about so many other things. They told me marijuana wasn't good for goodness sakes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I thought marijuana was wonderful. So I think maybe the same thing is happening to them, that when people are telling them that communism in Venezuela and China you know, has they're, maybe they're not believing what people are saying. Now, since that time, I have come to personally know people who were from China, who are natives from China, who mm -hmm. moved here, and who experienced um, their family being murdered, you know, through Mao Zedong's regime. And uh, people, just because they wore glasses, they were considered yeah. intellectuals and therefore a threat and mm -hmm. so on. And um, so I know, so I know, I believe them when they're telling me their story. And we were, I, when we were, I, I did go down to um, the Richmond Black Lives Matter rallies. And a friend of mine played a guitar and I had my djembe and I was playing it. And we were, we were just singing songs about Jesus. And, and then talking to individuals as we went around. And I, I just know that God cares for every single one of them. And I, I offered to pray for them. Uh, there was a, a li library that was set up there and it was all full of books by Marx and Lenin and Mao Zedong. So they're, I mean, it was, they're very upfront about what they're about. You know, it was not some secret thing. And I would, I would tell them that my experience is that that is not true, that socialism and communism are not the way. And I also agree that there are changes that need to be made. Yes. I mean, I'm totally against racism. And it seems like so many times you're trying to go through the system to take care of things. Like if you have some concerns, about racism or sexism, you try to go through the system and nothing is happening. And then you become violent and you get their attention and then maybe something will happen. I think that's kind of the philosophy too. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately that is sometimes the case. Right, right. And I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm grateful in a way that BLM and some of these issues have risen to the surface. I love in your testimony that your husband became a lawyer, a public defender, and he said, I know 
that black clients are often almost always treated, you know, less unfair or less fair. They get harder sentences. So I'm going to work extra hard for them. I want to be an advocate. You know, he, your husband was a white man and he got in touch with Jesus and he said, I'm going to labor for justice in partnership with Jesus, not by taking up guns or arms, but through prayer and through action. And, and so I don't mind that these issues have come to the forefront about racism in America. It's been a problem for a long time, for decades. You could argue since our founding. But what I take issue with is some of these radical attempts by force to change it, to change it overnight, and to change it in a way that's, that's man glorifying, that's human glorifying, that's forceful, and that is not involved in the mercy and grace of God. Uh, who loves everyone, whether they're sinners, right. you know, we're all sinners. <laughs> and so I, I look at, we have a need to get redeemed, to get in touch with God, who is the way, the, the truth, and the life. And then to begin to convert the planet uh, toward, you know, his kingdom coming. And, and that's one other thing I say is, you brought it up, you want to see change, you're young, you're frustrated, and you try the normal ways and it's not working. So you go, you know what, fed up with this, let's take up arms, let's march in the streets, let's force change. Because we want it and we want it now. I mean, that's our generation, isn't it? And it was true even then. Yeah. When you truly get in touch with Jesus and you read the Bible, you read the word of God, he tells you his plan to bring change. You got to read this book, folks, from Genesis to Revelation. You got to read it. It'll tell you Jesus is coming back. He came the first time about 2,000 years ago, and he's coming back very soon to bring forth justice. It, at that point, when he comes, it won't delay. There will be justice on earth as it is in heaven, and justice for all, black, white, and otherwise. And so in, in, the, in the waiting period, in the tension now, we get to pray, we get to seek his will, and we get to work for justice in constructive ways. But if we're demanding to have it all and have it now, we can end up in a dangerous pit. Again, I'm not saying we don't stop praying for it now. We don't stop believing to have as much of it as possible now, but the fullness comes when he comes. When the king comes to rule his kingdom, it'll look like heaven on earth. But until then, we're in a very much a divided state. And some are choosing light, some are choosing darkness. Some are choosing, oh, I want my kingdom now, but the king's not here yet in fullness. And he says, you can have pieces of it now. That's why we see healings now. That's why we see miracles now. But when he comes in fullness, everything will be put right. All injustice will be ended. And that's where I have to place my hope, not in my ability as a mere human being to make it happen in my own strength, because we fail. Uh, and the things that look so good, I love that you said this, communism and Marxism, socialism, it looks so good, it sounds so good, it's so perfect on paper, but no one's been able to live it out. Right. The people run from those regimes. They spend their life trying to get out, or they spend their life in prison. People escape right. communism and socialism every day, and they want to come to this country. And it's very interesting to me so many people in this country are being seduced into going for communism and socialism, right. the very things this country stands against at its founding, which is also why I think so many of these radicals want to get rid of history, edit it out, call it just the white man and oppressors and European, get rid of the monuments, get rid of history, because once you wipe that away, you can put in a new story, and oh no, America is going to be just like everyone else, and communists and China and all these things, and, and that's, I don't believe that's true. Right, I believe that they want to there are idealistic people who want things to get better, but there are other people who want to destroy our society. Yes. Not to destroy it. They're the ones paying them. Okay. Yes. Yes. I wanted to ask you about that. How are you paying the bills during your years as a radical? Or did you see funding coming in from other sources? What, what do you know about that? No, uh, we, we all worked. We all work. Gosh, yeah. heaven forbid. I don't know how many of the radicals today want to work. They just want to live off billionaire money. Some of these yeah. extremists who are funding them and pumping. I mean, again, look at the balance sheets. Where's the money coming in for, for Antifa or BLM? Where's it going? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you can research this stuff. It's out there, folks. And, and I, I guess I would say that's one of the big takeaways from this is don't believe the lie. Communism, socialism is not the way. It has not helped those countries that have implemented it. People right. flee from those regimes. And and it's not, it's not the way forward. Uh, I, well, it, it's that. interesting that we have a wall trying to keep people from coming in, and other places <laughs> have walls to keep people from escaping. So That's right. That's right. And you know, we have a whole generation now that's born after the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. But there was this epic wall dividing the city of Berlin between the free half and the communist half. And the communists had to build it to keep all the people from escaping. They wanted out. It was miserable. 
And right on the other side of this wall, in the same city, people are enjoying freedom and wealth and normal life. And on this side, they're being listened to and watched and surveillance and turned in for being a traitor to the state. All that stuff's coming here. Trust me, these people want absolute control and they'll do absolutely anything to get it. But our only hope is to truly get in touch with the eternal creator God who will come to judge the heaven and the earth. He will set you free on the inside first, and he will instruct you how to bring justice to society. And yes, some of this movement, these movements have risen up as a corrective to the church. The church, the followers of Jesus, have not been as vocal and as stringent and as ardent as we need to be in seeking true justice. But we're getting there. And some of this is to wake us up. Some of this say, hey, if you don't talk about these issues like race and injustice, the world will. And they're going to do it the world's way, communism and socialism, which is forced change. And God says, look, I want willing lovers. I want people that really love me and want to change, that will repent of their sins like you talked about, that will admit, God, I need a savior. I can't do it myself. That's the beauty of real Christianity. Amen. Elise, would you, um, would you say anything to people that are watching like they see the news, they see the protests, maybe they're a little afraid, they don't know how to interpret it, maybe, maybe they think the whole world's just going that way. Uh, you know, is there hope for this country? Is, is there a filter people need to put on themselves when they watch the news? Are, are they being told the whole story? Well, one thing I do is I don't watch the news. That's part of my filter. <laughs> Amen. I just maybe see a headline or see a headline on CBN News and I, I really just have to keep on crying out to the Lord. Yes. I, I have to, I, have to uh, I play Christian music I, that's joyful, and I, I praise the Lord, I trust in Him, and I don't, I don't feed too much on uh, end time prophecies that are negative, you know, things mm. like that. You know, not that I'm trying to be unrealistic, but I, I just trust in the Lord each day. Yes. And, Yes. For peace and tranquility. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, many of you have heard that prayer. Uh, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. And then it says what you just said, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts or trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Basically, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven others. That's true justice. Mm -hmm. Don't let us fall or lead us not into temptation or trial, but deliver us from evil and from the evil one. Amen. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Guys, there is, a, there is salvation in that prayer. You're, you're, you're asking for forgiveness of your sins. And you're saying, I also need to forgive others. There's so much rage in our culture. There's so much rage and injustice. How about forgiving and crying out for mercy on them? Not condoning what people have done, but, but it's been well proven that you tend to become like those you are most angry at or angry about. Have you heard this as well, Elisa? Wow. Like people grow up, maybe they had an abusive father or an angry mother, and they're like, I'm never going to be like my dad. He's awful. I hate him. It's been proven that the people who say that end up becoming most like their father or their mother, the person that they hate. And so the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That's James 1.20. We talk about that all the time. So if you, you can be upset, you can be, you can have an element of rage at injustice. I don't like it either. But what do I do with that? If I rise up in that same spirit, I'm just as guilty as the people that I'm accusing. But if I, if I take that anger to God and I cry out for justice, I confess my own sins. I confess my own shortcomings. And then I ask him to deal with, and I forgive those people. I ask him to deal with their shortcomings, their problems, their sins. I can have much more hope that God, who knows everyone, made everyone, and sustains the breath in each of our lungs, and is able to talk to you just like you talked to Elisa, and he talks to me. God will bring forth justice. He has promised it in his word. But unless you're partnered with the God of justice, you're doing it on your own strength, and you're going to fall. Elisa, mm -hmm. would you say a prayer for us, and maybe for anyone who's watching, or if you are watching and you share this with someone who you know is kind of caught up in that social justice movement and is trying to force change or getting riot and rage and all that, uh, would you say a prayer for anyone watching who wants to connect with Jesus like you did, who wants to know the real man of justice, would you, would you say a prayer for, for folks in that way, please? 
Yes. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these people who are listening, who whose hearts, Lord God, are for the poor, who are for the downtrodden, who are against racism, Lord God, who have noble pursuits. Lord, I just pray that you will guide them and direct them in decisions that they make. I pray that you will reveal yourself to them. You are the God of truth, and you are the way, the truth, and the life. And I pray that you will just bring a change about in our nation that will be glorifying you and will be actually you're the only answer would be the answer yes. to the situation yes I ask this all in the name of jesus amen 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 and i i just want to say this isn't about trump while i do believe he's god's man for the hour ultimately he can't solve all the issues i right. do believe he'll be reelected. But even if he gets in, like I've said, there will be a level of chaos and disruption that continues. And, and he is not the solution. Jesus is the solution. And right. so, yes, God raises up certain leaders and governors and politicians to do his will and his purposes. And even if Trump gets in, sure, I may be happy about that for certain reasons, you know, and, and whatnot, like the abortion issue or whatnot. But please, that is not going to solve all of our problems. So even if you're in that camp, I want to give you a word of caution. Uh, there's no salvation until we have Jesus. And it starts in here and then spreads into the earth and into society. So uh, thank you okay. so much. Oh, I, would like, I would just like to add to those people what I did when I stood out in that field. I said, God, if Jesus is the way and if you're real, let me know. And if you do that with an open heart, I believe God will let you know. And you'll Amen. 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 And that was true for you yeah. and for your husband, right? He said the same thing, basically. Yeah, it's yeah. true. Yeah, we serve a big God. He is big. And that's also why I don't watch much of the news, kind of like you. Right. I don't want to look at what is seen. It says, for the things that are unseen are greater. Yes. And it says, one day, you know, right now we have to have faith. We can't see Jesus physically. Uh, although, you know, some people may resemble him a little bit. <laughs> that's a <laughs> bad joke. I, I like to say I'm like movie star Jesus, you know, blonde Jesus. No, he wasn't blonde. Uh, but what I mean is you may see aspects of Jesus in people. They reflect him. But only when we see him physically and personally and fully, then there is fullness of salvation for the creation. But right now we're in the realm of faith. We have to believe. He does speak. He does talk. Like you getting that letter the day after you asked him. There's no way so that person, they had to send that letter three, four, five days in advance, especially to reach northern Minnesota. So we know that was the hand of God. And he, he is good. He's reaching out to humanity. He's reaching out to you. Whether you've known him in the past, whether you're far from him, you've never said yes to him, you've never given your life to him. Please start praying those prayers. God, I want to know you. Jesus, if you are who you say you are, show me. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Just begin wherever you're at in faith to reach out to him. He's already reaching out to you. Elisa, thank you so much for joining me on the program. It has been a pleasure here. I pray uh, this was greatly illuminating for people who want to know a little more what it was really like in the 60s and the radical movements that are still around now, just in different names and different forms, and a little bit about how you found real life and real meaning and real justice through Jesus Christ. Amen. So thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we look forward to bringing you more great content on The Bearded Prophet. Music